This video will cover chapter four. Chapter four is about getting network access. The chapter mainly covers the physical layer, which deals with signals, connectors, and cables, and also gets into the data link layer, which works very closely with the physical layer. Connecting to a network. If we want to use the advantages of a network, first we must connect to it. A home router such as this is an excellent device to take a look at because it offers many connection methods. It provides an embedded wireless antenna for wireless communication that many portable devices use. It contains a built-in switch. That built-in switch typically has four ports, and with that we would use a wired connection. And then we have a WAN connection, which is probably going to connect us to a cable modem or a DSL modem. This example here is showing a wired connection from that wireless home router. They refer to these as ISRs, or Integrated Service Routers, meaning they provide more than one thing. Here this router probably provides a firewall, might provide quality of service, provides wireless access, it provides wired access, and it allows us to share our internet connection amongst multiple computers. In order to connect to any type of network, we must have a network card. And those network cards are either going to be a wired network card or a wireless network card. And uh, the chapter section that deals with this slide uh, compares and contrasts wired networks to wireless networks. Typically with wired networks we can go longer distances, uh, we can offer greater speeds, we typically have a little bit better uh, port-based security, but with a wired connection we are limited in our mobility. Uh, we can't really move around a whole lot unless there's jacks available. With the wireless card we have uh, better mobility, um, but the signal typ typically does not go quite as far. Uh, the speeds usually aren't as fast as a wired connection, and uh, we all are using the same uh, medium uh, with wireless. And what I mean by that is uh, we're all using the air, and as we start to add more people in a room that are connecting to the same wireless, we can start to compete for access to that medium and notice, and notice a degradation in the quality and speeds that we're getting. As I said, this chapter talks about the physical layer, and the physical layer is at the very bottom of the OSI model. A lot of times you'll see that uh, the physical layer is represented by, by bits, ones and zeros. And there's different ways in which these ones and zeros can be represented. In this particular slide, they're showing the ones and zeros being represented by signals on a physical media. The three main types of physical media that we're going to talk about in this chapter are copper, which uses electrical signals. We'll also talk about fiber optic, which uses light pulses to transmit signals. And then we'll talk about wireless, which will use radio waves or microwaves to send signals through the air. As mentioned in an earlier chapter, all of these different standards and protocols and things that work on the physical layer are developed by different standard organizations. Organizations such as the ISO, EIA, TIA, ANSI, ITU-T, and the IEEE. This is a great slide to come back to to reference when you want to compare and contrast copper, fiber optic, and wireless media. It talks about some of the different physical components that you would see with copper versus fiber optic versus wireless. It talks about the frame coding technique, which I'm not too concerned about for this class, and it also talks about the, the signaling method. Just to point out a few here, with copper cable, the most common that we're going to see is the UTP, or unshielded twisted pair. In this class, we will make a patch cable or a crossover cable, and that is the type of cable that we will be working with. Fiber optic, which uses the light pulses, is going to work with either single-mode fiber or multi-mode fiber. With wireless, we are going to talk about access points, radios, and different types of antenna. Most of the different physical media is characterized by how fast and how far they can go. And how fast they can go is measured in terms of bandwidth. And bandwidth is going to be measured in bits per second. When we have a small b, that is bits per second. And if you saw a capital B, that would be bytes per second. Eight bits is equal to one byte. 
and they say one byte is roughly one character in size. So if I opened up a text document and I typed the letter A five times and I hit save, that text document is roughly five bytes in size because one character equals one byte. But again, our bandwidth is usually measured in bits per second. We have kilobits, which is 1,000. We have megabits, which is a million. We have gigabits, which is a billion. And terabits, which is a trillion. We have throughput. Uh, throughput is the actual measurement that we're getting at any point in time. Um, our cable speed may be rated at 100 megabits per second. But if I actually measure the speeds that I'm getting on that cable at that point in time, it's probably not going to be 100 megabits per second. Uh, there's some delay and some processing and some error correcting that, that comes into play. So in this example here, out of that 100 megabits per second, we're only getting 80.78 as our download speed. So that is our throughput, what we're actually getting at any point in time. So there are many different types of physical media out there. And the and this slide shows the back of a 1941 series Cisco router. And what I want you to take away from taking a look at the back of this router is that every single one of these connections has different specifications in order to guarantee that the port and connection is going to work successfully. The length of the cable, the, the connections pin out, the size of the connector, all of that is dictated by the physical media and the physical layer. As I said before, the most widely used type of cable out there is still copper cable. The reason why copper cable is the most widely used is it's inexpensive to use, it's very easy to learn how to use it, um, and the speeds and the distances that it go are definitely sufficient for most networks. Three different types of copper cable that are discussed in this chapter are unshielded twisted pair, Unshielded twisted pair does not have any shielding. It does not protect us from any electromagnetic interference. Electromagnetic interference can come from things uh, like fluorescent lighting or motors. I always use the example in class if you're ever watching TV um, and someone turns on the, the vacuum cleaner or the blender and you get those lines going across the TV. Uh, that's electromagnetic interference. The interference from the motor that's running is going through um, the copper cable that's connecting to the TV and you get that interference. Unshielded twisted pair is going to be the most uh, commonly used. The twisting in the pair of wires uh, produces a cancellation effect and allows the signal to travel down the line without it hopping from one wire to the next. The more twists that we have in the wire, the higher rated the category of the unshielded twisted pair is going to be. Shielded twisted pair is very similar to unshielded twisted pair, it just has um, some shielding in there to protect us from that electromagnetic interference. So if I do need to run uh, through like a boiler room where there's motors or up along fluorescent lighting, I could use shielded twisted pair, although it is going to, going to be more expensive. The last type of copper media discussed is coaxial cable. This is kind of a legacy um, media but it is still widely used because of the cable television industry and connecting to TVs. This slide here is a diagram of the unshielded twisted pair. Again, we have our twisted pairs. We typically have an outer jacket that can range in a variety of colors. Um, blue, white, I mean, you name it, you can buy it in whatever color that you wish. And what that outer jacket is going to do is protect that copper wire from physical damage. And then inside, we're going to have um, color-coded plastic insulation. It's, um, the colors are always going to be orange, green, blue, and brown. And then that same color mixed with white. So white orange, white green, white blue, and white brown. Here's a diagram with a shielded twisted pair. Notice we have the jacket, then we have a braided or foiled shield. We can have foil shields um, between each individual twisting of the pairs, although it does not have to be there. And then we have our same colors like we did with unshielded twisted pair. With the coaxial cable, we have the outer jacket, a braided copper shielding, we have a plastic insulation, and then we have our copper conductor. So we don't have twisting of wires, we don't have any pairs, we just have one copper conductor. Typical types of connectors that we use with our coax are going to be a BNC, British Naval Connector, the N-type, and what we most often see probably 
because of our television sets is the F type. With copper media, we always want to make sure that our ends are terminated properly. We always want to make sure that our equipment is grounded correctly and um, that we inspect our installations for damage. Because copper cable is transmitting electricity, this does pose a certain safety risk. The speeds at which we can use unshielded twisted pair depends on the category of cable. And as I said, the more twisting of the wire, the higher the category is going to be. In most current networks, you'll probably see category 5 or category 5E. Category 5 supports 100 megabits per second, uh, but can also go up to a gigabit per second, though they say it's not recommended. The Cat 5E does support the gigabit per second. As we're moving to faster data transmissions, uh, we get into category 6. Category 6 cable is going to have a divider to divide all um, four pairs of wires inside of that cable. So it makes it a little bit thicker, a little bit bulkier, but it can go quicker speeds. Uh, they're also going into category 7 type of cable. Uh, but mainly in this class, we'll talk about category 6 and category 5E. The type of connector used for unshielded twisted pair is known as an RJ45. The RJ45 has eight different copper pins that will push down into the copper wire after you crimp it into place. Depending on how you pin out that wire into the RJ45 is going to dictate what type of cable that you're using. There are two different types of standards coming from the EIA-TIA. There's the 568A and the 568B. If you make both ends 568A or both ends 568B, you're going to have a straight-through cable. A straight-through cable is going to be used to connect unlike devices together. So if I want to connect a PC to a switch, those are not the same devices. That would be, used, be using a straight-through cable. If I want to connect a switch to a router, unlike devices, that's going to be a straight-through cable. If I make one end 568A and the other end 568B, then I have a crossover cable. This is used to connect two like devices together. So if I connect a PC to a PC, that's a crossover cable. If I want to connect a router to router, crossover cable. Switch to switch, crossover. Switch to hub, because those are considered similar devices. That's a crossover cable. Really the only one exception to the rule is that when I want to connect um, a PC's network card to the fast Ethernet port of a router, that would be a crossover cable. So if I'm connecting PC to router, network card to fast Ethernet, I would then be using a crossover cable. And then there's a rollover cable. Rollover cables go pin 1 through 8 on one side and then 8 through 1 on the other. This is Cisco proprietary. This is used to connect to the console port of a router to configure it. After any type of unshielded twisted pair cable creation or installation, we always want to test the cables and certify the cables. We want to make sure that uh, the connectors are on there correctly. We have no signal loss. We have uh, no attenuation and that it meets the specifications and standards that are outlined. This is going to prevent things like crosstalk, signal loss, and network errors. Fiber optic cable. Fiber optic cable can typically go faster and longer distances. Places where we see fiber optic cable is in backbone runs in the enterprise network. Backbone runs would be used to connect building to building, maybe switch to switch where high volume traffic is, is located. We also see fiber optic in fiber to the home situations where internet service providers are bringing fiber right into the home to offer greater speeds. We see it in submarine applications where we need to send data undersea. And we also see it in our long haul runs where we have long distances that need to be bridged together. Uh, miles apart can be bridged together with fiber optic cable. Fiber optic uses light pulses, and because it uses light pulses, it is not susceptible to the electromagnetic interference that we talked about with uh, the copper cable. This slide here is showing a cross-section of the fiber media. Notice we have a jacket, we have um, a strengthening material, we have some sort of buffer, we have what's known as the cladding, and then the core. 
and the core is actually very thin glass or silica. The main two types of fiber optic, as I said, are single mode and multi mode. Uh, single mode fiber has a very small core, which is about 9 microns in size. Because of the smaller core, we have less dispersion of light, and with less dispersion of light, that means that we can go further distances, and our speeds have the possibility of being greater than multi-mode fiber. We typically will use laser lights as the light source to send our pulses with single-mode fiber. Multi-mode fiber has a larger core, between 50 and 62 and a half microns. The larger core does give more dispersion of light. Because of this, it does not go quite as far and does not have the capability of going quite as fast. They can handle going around bends and corners uh, better than single mode fiber. And we will typically use LEDs as the light sources for, for multi-mode fiber. Some different types of connectors that we'll see are the ST connectors, the SC connectors, an LC connector, and then when we're running duplex, which means sending and receiving at the same time, then we have uh, double connectors. If you see these sorts of connectors, um, you should automatically know that uh, you're working with fiber optic cable. To test fiber optic cable, we use an OTDR, an optical time domain reflectometer. Just like installing unshielded twisted pair or copper cable, we want to test our fiber optic cable after we get the ends on and after we have it installed in our network. This is a nice chart comparing and comp contrasting fiber versus copper. Copper can go between 10 and 10 gigabits per second. Copper can go between 10 megabits and 10 gigabits per second, where fiber optic can get up to the 100 gigabits per second. The distance is going to be 100 meters with copper. Fiber optic can go 100,000 meters. Again, fiber optic is going to be immune to our interference. There's no electricity, so we don't have any electrical hazards. Uh, but the downfall of fiber optic is the last three. The cost to implement fiber optic is still higher than copper media. The skills required to do fiber optic does require some specialized training, and uh, we do have to have higher safety precautions with fiber optic uh, because you may be using chemicals for the splicing and buffing of the fiber optic. If money were no object, we would probably all be using fiber optic, but unfortunately it is, so copper media is still very, very popular uh, when compared with fiber optic. Wireless media. Here are a bunch of different symbols that you will see for wireless media. They almost all have the radio wave mark in, integrated with the, within the symbol though. Some different types of wireless media. Most often we're probably talking about Wi-Fi, which is the IEEE 802.11 standard. This uses carrier sense multiple access collision avoidance. We try to avoid collisions or signals running into each other at all costs with Wi-Fi. Uh, because of that, the speeds that are listed, for example, 802.11g is 54 megabits per second. We're probably not actually going to get um, 54 megabits per second of actual data because we have a lot of overhead that, are trying, that is trying to avoid those collisions. The 802.11g and end are probably still the most common that are out there. The end can go up to 600 megabits per second. It operates in the 2.4 to 5 gigahertz um, frequency range, we're starting to see uh, 802.11ac and 802.11ad units become available and more popular as well. Uh, but the cost for the AC and the AD units is still pretty high when compared to uh, the N and the G. We have Bluetooth, which is another IEEE standard, 802.15. Uh, Bluetooth is typically used to tether two devices together and it can be used to uh, transmit data. The speeds aren't really that great, it's only 3 megabits per second, and the distance isn't really that great, but it is a rock-solid, secure communication between those two devices. And then we have WiMAX, another IEEE standard, 802.16. These can provide speeds up to 1 gigabits per second. It uses a point-to-multipoint uh, topology to provide wireless broadband access to its customers.
As you can see in this picture, many of the new wireless access points and wireless routers don't have any antenna on them, but they could be added later if you want to try to increase your distance or your directional path for the wireless media. This particular example is an EA6500 which runs the 802.11ac. Again, here's a nice little chart showing all the different uh, Wi-Fi standards. And uh, as you go up in the standards, you'll notice that they're all backwards compatible. The last part of this chapter goes to the data link layer, and I'm just going to skim through these chapters and just point out a few things. The data link layer operates in two different areas, the LLC sublayer and also the MAC sublayer. Really what the data link layer is in charge of is preparing frames to be sent across different types of media. If we're going to be sending a frame across copper ethernet or through Wi-Fi or potentially through satellite communication, we need to modify the frame so that it can be sent over each one of these types of media. At the data link layer, we add a header and a trailer. Inside of the header, we have some addressing. And the part of the addressing that we add is the MAC or physical addresses. This is going to be the source and the destination. We talked about this a little bit in chapter three, and we said that these addresses can and probably will change throughout the transmission of that frame or packet. At the end, we have the trailer. Uh, the main thing with the trailer I want you to know about is the error detection, which usually is in the form of a frame check sequence number. This is a number that's calculated before the frame gets sent, and when the frame is received, it's recalculated. If the number matches up, then the frame is considered whole and complete. If it's not, then that means that the frame is potentially corrupt and it will be resent. Here are some different standards that work at the data link layer. We have Ethernet, which we will mainly talk about in this class. We also have token bus, token passing, Wi-Fi or 802.11, which is another important aspect of this class. Some other ones you'll see the HDLC, frame relay, and ISDN, just to point out a few. The data link layer is also in charge of controlling access to the media. We can't just have a bunch of computers trying to communicate on the wire at the same time because we can potentially um, have collisions. We need rules for how to communicate and share the media. The rules for how we're going to communicate and share the media depend on our physical and our logical topology. Uh, physical topology is how something is actually physically laid out and cabled out. Where are the computers located? Where are the hubs and the switches and the routers located within a building? That's our physical topology. A logical topology has to do with how we control that access to the media. Is it point to point? Is it a token ring passing scenario? Is it um, a star type of topology? Not that we're laid out in a star, or not that uh, we're laid out in a ring, but that's how we control access to the media. Some common physical WAN topologies are going to be point-to-point. -point. We just have two computers or two routers uh, communicating. A hub-and-spoke topology, we see this a lot in today's networks. We're at the middle, we'd have a central switch or a central hub, hopefully no hubs, but a central switch and then computers connecting and plugged into that switch. Uh, full mesh topology, this goes back to chapter one when we talked about uh, redundancy and fault tolerance, multiple paths to multiple destinations. Typically how this looks in a modern network is having multiple switches or multiple routers, maybe in a stack scenario. I said that in a shared media scenario that we can't just have all computers communicating at once because we can potentially have uh, collisions. And this is really only going to be true in a half duplex scenario. Half duplex works in only one direction. It's kind of like using a walkie talkie. If you ever used a walkie talkie before to communicate, you can either talk by pushing in the button or you listen by releasing the button. You can't do both at the same. And this is how a hub operates. Hubs operate in half duplex. They can send or they can receive. They can't do both at the same time. And because of that, we can potentially have collisions. 
we could potentially have two people pushing the button at the same time to try to talk with a walkie-talkie and it does not work. What switches provide for us is full duplex. Full duplex means that we can send and receive at the same time. This essentially doubles our bandwidth. This is sort of like talking on the telephone. When you talk on the telephone, you can talk and you can listen at the same time. You don't have to push in any button. You just go ahead and talk and uh, you can also hear the person on the other end. So in this type of scenario, we're not gonna have collisions. So with switches, we're not gonna have collisions. We're going to double our bandwidth and the network's going to operate a little bit more smoothly. So whenever possible, you do wanna use switches instead of hubs. If hubs are out there, try to replace them. Um, on a smaller scale network, maybe only five, six computers, hubs will work just fine. Um, anything larger than that, I would recommend replacing with a switch. We talked about that physical topology, how things are actually uh, laid out. Most often we have the star topology, usually in the middle we'll have um, switches, extended star, switch to switch, and then branched out from there. Uh, the bus topology, don't see this quite often anymore, but you'd have a central line um, that all the computers would tap into, and then a ring topology, where they're physically located out in a ring. So the logical topology is not so much how it's laid out, but more how it works. Two different ways in which we're going to control the logical topology. One is contention-based access, and one is controlled access. With contention-based access, um, all stations can theoretically transmit at the same time. Collisions can happen, unless, of course, we have a switch. And there are mechanisms to resolve the contention for the media. Our contention-based technologies are going to be Ethernet, which is 802.3, and wireless, which is 802.11. Ethernet uses carrier sense multiple access collision detection, which means we will try to detect any collisions that happen. Two devices communicating at the same time, their signals happen to collide, everybody else in the network is made aware of that collision and we retransmit the data. What we do in Ethernet is we try to listen for absence of signal on the wire, and when we think that there's absence of signal on the wire, we go ahead and try to um, send our data. Well, it could happen that two computers sense absence of signal on the data at the same time, and uh, then they try to transmit at the same time, and, and a collision happens. Wireless uses carrier sense multiple access collision avoidance. With this, we don't try to detect collisions as they happen, we try to avoid them at all costs. And because of this, we have a lot more information in the header and the trailer, in the header of a wireless frame. That's why with wireless, you don't quite get all the speed that is advertised because there's a lot of overhead in the packets. Controlled access, on the other hand, is used in token ring or FDDI scenarios. With this, only one station can transmit at a time. There are gonna be no collisions. Devices that wanna transmit must wait for their turn, and they use a token pass, passing method. Think of a classroom, and in the classroom, usually only one person communicates. Typically, it's the teacher. If someone else wants to communicate, they raise their hand. The teacher then points to that person, and then that person is the only other person communicating in the room. If you want to further that scenario, you have a token. Maybe it's a ruler, and who's ever holding the ruler gets to communicate. So if the teacher wants to communicate to the class, they hold the ruler, they communicate to the class, someone else wants to communicate, they raise their hand, the teacher passes that student or that person uh, the ruler, and now that person can communicate. So whoever has that token or whoever has that ruler can communicate. So this is great when you don't want collisions to occur, and you want guaranteed delivery of data. I talked about wireless frames having higher overhead because we're in a fragile environment. More controls are needed to ensure that delivery. More controls are needed to try to avoid those collisions. So our higher overhead is gonna mean slower transmission rates. We're in a protected environment like a wired environment. Uh, we have lower overhead, so we have faster transmission. We don't need quite as many controls. We have smaller fields and smaller uh, frames. We don't have, this is an example of what an Ethernet frame has. Notice we have the preamble, 
destination and the source. That destination and source is going to be our MAC addresses. We have a type, we have our actual data, and then we have that frame check sequence to check for data. Uh, pretty small, pretty compact, um, not a whole lot of header information in here. There is not a whole lot of overhead. When we compare that to a wireless frame here, we can see it's a lot larger. We have a lot more information. We have some frame control, we have duration, uh, we have protocol versions, we have encryption, we have other things that are, that are going on in this wireless frame. So we have a lot more overhead that we're working with and our speeds are not gonna be that great. But we need this overhead in here to ensure reliable delivery because we're going over a more fragile environment. That is all for this video on chapter four. Thanks for watching.